Tom again. Tom. Tom, how are you? From the moment Kurt Cobain bursts into the public scene with Smells Like Teen Spirit, there has been an absolute obsession, cultural obsession with Kurt that has grown proportionally every year to the point that he is probably one of the biggest cultural icons of the last 30 years. But Kurt had very limited interactions with media during his lifetime. And so the public's perception of Kurt, for the most part over the course of the last 25 years, has been heavily steeped in mythology and projection and fantasy. And with Montage of Heck for the first time, audiences are going to meet Kurt Cobain. I wanted the movie to be a sublime experience. I wanted it to be, and one of my favorite movies was Pink Floyd The Wall. I saw Pink Floyd The Wall every day for a week when it came out. I played the Village Theater in Westwood. What I loved about The Wall was like this sort of fucked up, like, whoa, anything goes mentality. Like, now you're in this scene, and now you're in animation. And, I, and so I wanted the film to have that sort of vibe that you don't know what's coming next. And because I find it to be very exciting and as a viewer when you're in these sort of movies. You know, it's like if Disneyland had a ride called Kurt Cobain, like I wanted the film to be that ride. It's a immersive ride through Kurt's life. Who was the first interviewee you got on board then? Uh, well, everybody came on board when we asked them, uh, for the most part. Kurt's mother, father, and sister had never done an on-camera interview in their lives. And I think with everything with this film, the fact that Francis Cobain was involved um, gave people a tremendous amount of comfort. I think that if Chris or Dave had tried to make the film, they might have run into some interference from other parties. I think if Courtney had tried to make the film, she would have run into interference. I think if Wendy Cobain had made the film, she would have run into interference. I think it was really Francis neutralized everything. Everyone who was involved with Kurt's life feels a tremendous amount of responsibility, I think, towards Francis. And, um, and so everyone participated. Courtney must have got to a point where she just said, fuck it, enough's enough. Go do whatever the hell you're gonna do. I mean, Courtney gave me the keys to her storage facility and didn't ask to see the film until it was finished. Had waived all editorial control over the film. She didn't have to do that. Has she told you why? Yeah, she said she trusted me implicitly um, based upon my previous work. Kurt's archives are stored in a storage facility. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've ever been to a storage facility, you know that they're somewhat innocuous, sort of bland, fluorescent lit. Just, they're not meant to be comforting places. They're meant you know, to store stuff. I had imagined in my mind that the, I was going to open up a door and it was going to kind of look like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark or Citizen Kane. There was going to be this, this just endless boxes and just what have you. And I'm led into this room that was um, probably by like 40 by 40 or something. And, was, uh, and there were like 15 boxes. And in the, the context of this room, it didn't look like a lot. And I remember walking in and I turned to the guy and I said, where is everything? And he goes, well, this is everything. And he had the paintings laid out and whatnot. And as I started to open the boxes, each box was like another story or another layer. Really, the, the, the real magic happened when I opened up box 18, which said cassettes. And nobody had told me there was gonna be any audio there. And I opened up this box and there's 108 cassettes. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna listen to this, if you don't mind. And there was a moment where I have my headphones on and I'm surrounded by all of Kurt's belongings and possessions and his paintings and his shoes and his, all of his guitars and I'm sort of immersed in this Cobain world. And I see this tape, it was tape 58 called Montage of Heck. 
in touch of heck, what's that? And I put it in, I have my headphones on, and I have a team of people working around me and whatnot. And suddenly I was transported. I hear this tape, and the tape is, is this mixtape Kurt did in 88, which I subsequently learned. Um, and it's a combination of like Simon and Garfunkel, The Beatles, Black Flag, science fiction films, horror films, um, self-improvement tapes, this whole mishmash that could best be described as like kitschy, funny, scary, all these things that were Kurt. And it felt like a portal in the Kurt's mind. And so here I am surrounded by his art and all of these things and his master recordings and all this incredible stuff that the world has now associated with Kurt Cobain. And this one thing that's in my ears is as I feel at that moment is as close as I'll ever get to Kurt. And that sort of gave me the, um, the, the blueprint, if you will, to make the movie. And this is like pretty amazing. So I just flipped this page here and it says, either I care too much or I don't care enough, I haven't quite decided. So it's sort of like, it's like everything in here, every sort of place you turn is, um, reveals something else. I try to collect everything in existence on a subject. In this case, that included Kurt's artifacts, materials that the other Cobain members had. I would screen everything chronologically. And the reason I do that is these themes start to emerge when you screen that way. By the time I was done screening, it took three hours to write the script for the film that's on screen right now. It just poured out of me. But the reason it happened so quickly is I'm holding this in, I'm holding it in, I'm holding it in, and finally I'm like, okay, I finished screening, I put a pen in my hand, and it just takes over. And in this case, the themes of family on a talking head movie with a hundred different people. I wanted to keep it as intimate as possible. The idea was that these people would be the same people who would be at Kurt's funeral if he was a janitor. These are the five closest people to Kurt Cobain in his lifetime. This isn't like VH1 and people aren't speaking in sound bites. They're haunted and they're touched by Kurt. And I believe that intimacy really helps power and fuel the film. What I do is I embellish. That doesn't mean lie, that means, that me it's the opposite. It means create an experience. And so if I'm gonna have a scene of the band performing, I want you to feel as if you are a part of that and you're there. People are gonna wanna see this movie, I'm sure gonna wanna rock out. I started working on the film, I knew there was gonna be animation. I knew I wanted to bring his art to life, that because the movie was intended to be experiential, I wasn't just gonna like, here's a painting, I wanted to get inside. The thing that became readily apparent is that we needed to work in an analog space. And so we went about creating a visual style that felt like almost as if Kurt was shooting his journals himself with a Super 8 camera. So I knew there would be a form of animation but I didn't realize that I was gonna to need to actually render Kurt physically, that there would, I would need to physically animate Kurt. And that came about when I heard all this amazing audio. So I found this amazing artist um, in the Netherlands named Hisko Husling, uh, who has this wonderful painterly style of animation. And um, we use that to convey these scenes of Kurt's childhood. As you described earlier, surrounded by Kurt's stuff, his shoes, his guitars. You must have had some quite, some dark moments. I didn't. Um, I wanted the film to have a sort of unflinching honesty. And some of the more painful elements of the film are incredibly unpleasant. You don't want to look at them um, because they're ugly. It's an ugly side of humanity, but it's, it's, a, it's real. So yeah, there, there, was a, there were tons of moments where it felt so intimate, but Kurt did not shy from writing things that are so brutally honest, they kind of make you cringe. 
You know, like it, like who writes some of this stuff? You know, you think it, but put pen to paper. My God, I was so inspired by Kurt, and it's difficult to say, but I felt closer to Kurt than any of my friends over the last couple of years. And um, really felt at a certain point that I understood him. The way a director needs to understand a character in their movie. Do you feel like you understand Courtney more as well now? Because you can kind of see, because I, I think Courtney in some ways is quite a misunderstood person and people forget that she's actually been through something that's incredibly traumatic. They do and it is brutal. But her husband took his own life. And he was the love of her life. And when you see the movie, you see that they loved each other. In that 25-year-old, fiery, passionate love. But I wasn't doing a portrait of Courtney. I was doing a portrait of Kurt. And it was important for me to communicate to the audience what Kurt's, how Kurt viewed Courtney. All the footage I saw of them alone, footage that was never meant to be disseminated, was a tremendous amount of love. You literally go through life with Kurt Cobain in this film, and you go through it through his eyes and through his experience. And um, that's really rare in a documentary to have that level of documentation, but it was a combination of both the mother keeping everything and Kurt creating art constantly throughout his life. He probably created one of the most comprehensive audiovisual autobiographies of anyone in my generation. And so it was a unique opportunity to do something that's never been done, which is present an American icon, a revered American icon, in a completely naked and honest manner, without tearing him down, and without building him up, but where we can look him in the eye. This time, yeah. Um, Jimmy, how are we looking there? 100%. Let's go. Great. Let's go. Okay. So, um, Cordy, when you were younger, what was your idea of like Prince Charming? Oh man, I didn't really have one. Um, that's a trick question. Let me see. Uh, well, I did. I mean, but when I was young, when I, you're talking about before I was sexually active, and be, before I was sexually active, I was hanging around with rock stars. So, um, I had a huge crush on the first one that mentored me. His name was Julian Cope. He's been forgotten by history, pretty much, but. Um, he was part of that sort of Liverpool Echo and the Bunnymen scene. There was a scene, there was a moment there. And, um, and when I got out of juvenile hall, um, which was m mixed sexes, it was co-ed, but um, you know, I'd been sequestered in, in all-girl boarding schools and then I was in a mixed co-ed juvenile hall. None of the stoner guys appealed to me. Um, the libraries in the, both the juvenile halls I was in, one was in Eugene, Oregon, and one was in Salem, Oregon, were stuffed with Harlequin romances and also Reader's Digest uh, classics. So I have read Moby Dick, but I've read the Reader's Digest version. Do you know what I mean? And they have, I've read War and Peace, but I've read the Reader's Digest version. So I read the Harlequin romances. They didn't really appeal to me. So after about 10 of them or eight of them, they're all the same. They're all just like, this dominant male that comes in and busts open your your boost and da 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 and this passive female and I didn't see myself really as the passive female pretty enough to fit that mold or whatever um, when I was before I was sexually active and um, and then I went to D D D D Dublin and um, 
Well, also, there's there's sexually active, and then there's stripping. So stripping was before I was sexually active too. So I didn't have the quick answer is I didn't really have one. You didn't have the like I'm gonna get married at 22, get a white picket fence. No, I'm gonna be a movie star and a rock star too. I'm gonna be a movie star and a rock star too. I'm gonna be a movie star and a rock star too. I was just pure ball of ambition, and um, and um, and you, and there was like resentment with I, I don't want to say resentment, but I know that it seemed like with Kurt when you were pregnant, there was some bitterness that he got to be a rock icon and you were on the cusp of becoming a rock icon. I coveted his is is the success that was so fast. Not initially, I was really 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 excited for them. Um, I was um, just in, when we were still platonic. Um, I was on the ferry. Um, Billy Corgan would not pay for my flight back from Roskilde, and Nirvana had p pl played with the Pumpkins at that show. So I was on the ferry with the Nirvana guys, and um, I had a crush on Kurt. He was gorgeous. I mean, he was beautiful and and enigmatic and evasive. And this is after Reading, but I still was dating and sleeping with Billy Corgan. Um, but he kind of lost me at this moment. This isn't the moment he specifically lost me. That would be about six, eight months later. But um, he kind of lost me at this moment. So Alex McLeod, who was the road manager, goes, you guys are the most requested song on K-Rock. And I was the one that had earlier told all of them, Dave, Chris, and Kurt, don't put out Smells Like Teen Spirit. Put it in bloom. It's a better song. I swear to God, I, I made an impassioned whole speech about it. It's a better song. Don't put out Smells Like Teen Spirit first. And, Obviously, I was wrong, um, but Smells Like Teen Spirit was getting super big requests at K-Rock, and Kurt didn't know what that meant. He didn't know what that meant. Like, he, he didn't even, even know what I meant. I was such a scenester that, like, he had to go to Dave Grohl and say, why is Calvin calling his band Courtney Love? And Dave's like, you don't know who Courtney Love is? Because I was a well-known scene star. If I came to see your band, me and this girl Jennifer Finch from L7, if we came to see your band, your band was like on the radar. If Jennifer flashed you, your band was on the radar. If I stage dived, your band was on the radar. So we were kind of like very much hanging out with the Peppers, very Why much. Because I Because I hadn't made it in a rock band yet, but I was going to. So I wasn't a groupie. I wasn't a groupie. I wasn't like sleeping with guys in bands. That's not what I was doing. But I was a, a, a scene star, just a really well-known scene star. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, that's what I was. So Kerr knew that I was well-known enough that Calvin, uh, uh, what's Calvin's Calvin last? Harris. Not Calvin Harris, no, Calvin, no. you know, I'm Calvin Kill Rock Stars. Yeah. Right, Kill, Kill Rock Stars. And Lois, my old roommate, they had named their band Courtney Love and I remember calling Calvin and saying, I'm going to be, my band's going to be really big. You need to change the name. No one's ever going to hear of you, lady. And, and even up till very recently, Dave Navarro had a radio show and he was playing these Courtney Love records. And he goes, I thought that was your first thing. I'm like, no, no, dude. Can you hold on one sec? Yeah. Um, Jimmy, the pro I'm just glanced over the profile shot. Should he be on a slider so he can um, get around her a little bit, get in front a little bit? Yeah, there's a couple of adjustments. Can we make a couple adjustments right now? Yep. Cody, I'm just going to stop you for a sec. Okay. Don, um, have, do you get a lot of interview requests? Well, we did earlier years, but nothing, you know, really in the last few years or so. You were saying we, before we, we started, how's your memory with, with some of this stuff? Well, what do you mean? I mean, uh, you know, I had him since he was nine years old. He lived with me. And uh, then I met Jennifer and we got married and, and we had him all the way up to about he's 15 years old because in that, between that time and stuff, he, you know, had problems and stuff with uh, other kids and uh, I don't know, he just, we tried with what we could. We had some really good times and everything too. We used to go camping all the time and and 
all, all three toe heads, you know, together, and <laughs> you know, it was a lot of a lot of good times. He played baseball, stuff, and he, you know, did all of his artwork, and and uh, you know, he used to do little puppet shows and things, and all. Even when he was a young kid, he uh, he was a very good entertainer, because every uh, you know, the Wendy's family was a big family, and he was a center of attention. So, you know, he was like a normal kid then. And then when he got older, it just started changing, like, so. Mainly probably because of divorce. I think the divorce sort of set him off, like, to where, you know, he resented it. And, I don't know, just did, did his own thing, you know. <laughs> it's just, we really, uh, we tried the best we could and everything with him, but, you know, he was a talented person and everything. I think he was just probably, you know, how sort of like geniuses are and stuff like that. He was just, you know, way far ahead of everybody else and, you know, did his own thing. And, you know, how people that got a lot of talent and stuff like that usually have a little problem. Everything so, and I think there's one thing that I said at one time that I was never going to get married again, and I think he took that for a word. So, and I don't know if that did it or what, but I don't know. He, me, you know, I just say I'm easy going and stuff, and, and all through the, you know, when I had him, it was great. And everything, you know, we had good times together, and it was just, I don't know how it. I guess I could have been a better father, but we just had a lot of problems with him. And I think, you know, he just rebelled and stuff. And what sort but, of problems? Well, he'd pick on the other kids, and, you know, he'd get in trouble at school. And he wouldn't mind and stuff like that. So. What do you mean he wouldn't mind? Well, you know, when you ask him to do stuff or anything like that. And when you ask him to do stuff, what would happen? Well, he wouldn't do it or wouldn't do it properly. Or... Rebellious? So, yeah, he was. When did you first notice that Kurt was special? Artistically. Oh, I remember when I was two years old, <laughs> you know, he would perform for everybody, played the drums and, you know, did dances and stuff and dressed up and he put on little shows all the time. It was very, it was encouraged by Wendy's side of the family and stuff, so, because my family wasn't too close, we're not very loving or anything like that, so, until I met Jennifer. <laughs> so. What do you mean your family wasn't very loving? Well, there was no love in our family, in my family, my mom and dad. Because they were, my dad was from the old, you know, how the old people, <laughs> how to raise kids and stuff and everything like that. So it's his way or the highway and we got beat with a belt. And, so I, you know, that's the way I was brought up. So maybe I carried a little bit of that with me too, so. Um, all right, Kim, so let's start at the beginning. All right, well, to start off, you know, my very first memory is with my brother. And we were outside, and I was probably three, and I'm in my little pink fluffy dress, and he's got me flipping off the cops <laughs> as they go by. And as my mother says, the, the cop 
came around the block and came up and knocked on the door after Kurt and I ran in the house and uh, knocked on the door and said, uh, you know, your son is out in the yard having your poor little daughter <laughs> flipping the bird to the cops. <laughs> How old was Kurt? Well, if I was three, he was probably about six. <laughs> That yeah. was like a thing because I've seen some of that in some of the. Oh, movies. he's always flipping. Yeah, he's always flipping the bird. I don't know where he got it. Um, what um, he used to do it. I guess my mom was saying that uh, even friends of hers would, when they were driving, and if a guy looked at my mom, he'd be in the back window, like glaring and flipping them off and <laughs> trying to get, you know, trying to like protect his mom, and uh, and then we. You know, as we grew up, I mean, it was always him. He called the UPS truck SWAT, you know, a SWAT truck, and, you know, he got into SWAT, and he was all into that. And then, you know, he'd yell out yell out at the cops, like, corn on the cops, corn on the cops, and thought that was hilarious. He, um, he early on picked up the, the cops sort of on his own, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. I mean... We never had any problems with police, <laughs> and for some reason, I mean, even though he watched like Adam Twelve and you know watched all these police shows like SWAT and all that, um, you know, he just had like some already wanted to test authority. I guess is kind of how I saw it. Was there? Do you remember when the f two of you were living with um, Don and your mom? Was there a lot of tranquility in the house, or what was it like? You know, I was so young, I really don't remember a lot. I mean, I barely remember my dad being in the house. Um, I know that he did a lot of sports and all that, so he wasn't around in the house a lot. But really, my only images of my dad being there um, was him and his tidy whities wandering around the house. And the when we watched uh, uh, the first time The Wizard of Oz, and I was so scared of the flying monkeys, I was hiding behind my dad and scared of the witch and all that, but I was like four. So, you know, it was never, I, I don't remember it. Like, Kurt was so affected by the divorce and I didn't really have any feelings towards it because I was, you know, I was five when my dad was finally moved out, so. Since you brought it up, how did you see him, how did he seem affected by the divorce? Um, he just seemed like, he didn't like the broken up family. He, he was very family oriented. He was very, you know, I mean, that's what we had all the time. And it was just, I guess it was just, you know, from what he has said is just, it was not common. It wasn't extremely common for divorce at that age, you know, in that time, at that exact time in our town. Um, and he didn't want to have a broken up family. And I guess, I don't know, I guess it embarrassed him or whatever. But, you know, I, I didn't, I, you know, for myself, it didn't do anything to me. Um, but for him, and then, you know, I mean, he wasn't happy about it, but then, you know, he, he was the one that asked to live with his dad. And that's also just kind of how it went when there was divorce. It was the son went with the dad, the daughter went with the mom. And, you know, and they had a good relationship and they did get closer that first probably year that they were, you know, living together and stuff. Um, but, you know, then my dad remarried and brought in a whole new family and kind of, you know, kind of didn't want the old family to interfere with the new family. So, you know, I think Kurt was kind of pushed to the side and he got all the blame because he was the oldest for anything that went wrong with like the step brother and stepsister and, and all that. You've told me some, some of that stuff before, like what sort of stuff would happen? You know, I wouldn't know the exact specifics for that because um, I wasn't there. You know, I'm living with my mom, anything that happened there. Um, you know, I mean, he got grounded for an entire year because he forgot to feed the dog. And... When he was living with your My mom. dad. With my dad. Um, and wasn't allowed, you know, he's grounded from watching television. So the whole family would, after dinner, sit down and watch a, a show and Kurt would be sent to his room. And, you know, and they stuck to like the full year. And that was just, <laughs> it's like, usually it's like, ah, you're grounded for a year. And, you know, it's like, ah, a week later, it's like, whatever. But, you know, it, it was, you know, he was very hurt by that. And, you know, kind of got pushed to the side from, from my dad. 
because my dad wanted, you know, kind of wanted, I think my dad just wanted to like start over because, you know, he wasn't happy when my mom divorced him. And, you know, he just, you know, kind of almost tried to use us kids as torture to my mom because my mom, you know, just adored us so, you know, I mean, she was our mom. She loved us so much and wanted the best for us and everything. And he knew that was the only way he could hurt her. It was to kind of hurt us. And, but I don't think it was extreme. I don't know if it was like totally intentional, but that's what it felt like. Did you, um, is that something you knew at the time or is that something Kurt told you later in life about being grounded for He you? would, no, he, I, I knew about it. I knew in the, at that time that, you know, because he, like, that was probably, I mean, I don't even know how old he was. He must have been like 12, you know, 12, 13 years old. Um, I don't know exactly how old he was, but right about that time is when him and I would like, you know, if the parents were fighting or, you know, there was turmoil going on or whatever, we would, you know, we kind of like snuck away to our room and like sat and talked and, you know, just kind of like, we need to stick together and, you know, no matter what the parents are fighting about, it's no big deal. It's, you know, it's their deal. It's not ours. And, you know, we bonded a little more because of that. Just like, okay, let's not be the fighting kids that we were because, I mean, he was a little shit as a kid, you know. He was the big brother that picked on the little sister and, you know, I used to just, ugh, he used to just torment me sometimes just, just to get a reaction. And my mom taught me, like, if you don't react, he'll stop doing it. <laughs> and I just couldn't not react. And I always wanted to get him, you know, get him back tenfold. And uh, so when we were kids, it was, uh, you know, I'd be watching, I like Mr. Rogers. And he hated Mr. Rogers. And we had one of those, you know, old console televisions. And I'd have to go over and take the knob off the, off the TV so that he couldn't change the channel. And or I'd, be, I'd get really focused, and so I'd focus on whatever I was watching on TV, and he'd come over and, like, sit on my head and fart. Or, <laughs> you know, um, wrap me up in a, you know, knew I was claustrophobic, so he would, you know, grab my sleeping bag and wrap it around me. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, he would just do little, little, you know, big brother things. You know, we're only three years apart, so it was, it was pick on the little one, and also, you know, I did my share of, you know, picking on him too. And he didn't like it. Like we got along really great in our early, early childhood because he was like so happy to have a sibling. And then as soon as I was able to like really get into his stuff and want to play with his toys. And, you know, of course I was younger and clumsier and I'd break something or whatever and he'd get really upset. And then, the then it all turned when we were teenagers. He would like for some reason want to go into my room and either, you know, take my, I was very OCD and like I had my Rubik's cube all perfect and he'd go in there and like mess it all up and, you know, little things. I don't know why he was obsessed with going into my room and taking my things or moving stuff around or whatever, but just to torment me, I guess. <laughs> About how long is this session going to be? <clears throat> uh, it's mean, better for me to know. I mean, if it's going to be two hours, one hour, half hour, um, just approximate. You mean until we wrap or just before we take a break? Before we take a break. Whenever you take a long break. But we have lunch coming <laughs> at like 4.30, like in an hour. Okay. Or four. Um, all right, Wendy. So what I was just asking about, like how every kid's different. How would you? What? How does Kurt? Not do in comparison to the other two. Oh. But just Kurt. What is the thing that sort of? Well, I'll just think about what differentiated him from Kim. Okay. And, but I won't mention her. Um, he was like always going fast, fast, fast. Outgoing, friendly. Went to anybody. Um, happy, silly, and just a nutball. He loved joking around, and, and this is when he was young. And, um, and that stayed with him for quite a long time, till he was probably about 11. And then 
And then he just started getting more, uh, you know, calm, calm and more, in, not in, I don't want to say introverted because he didn't really ever get introverted. But just, I guess maybe hormones were starting. I don't know if that was changing things. Just more of a, you know, not so quite so silly. And, you know, I <clears throat> could have nicknamed him Flash because he was going one way. I have so many pictures of him just running and jumping and doing somersaults and jumping off of things and always standing on the hearth at the fireplace and jumping off and rocking in the rocking chair like 90 miles an hour. And he was just really, that was his basic personality, was very outgoing, loved people, went to people, e other people e easily. How old was he when he moved back, moved back in with you? And what changes did you see from the time he left when he was nine or 10 to when he came back after Dawn's? Well, he'd gone to Jim's and then he went to my brother's. So when he came back, he loved both of them equally. They were very different, but he really, really liked those two guys. And he came back very happy, very stable. Um, they had a very stable household. There were rules. There were, you know, uh, a lot of attention from Chuck and Joan. They both did just a miraculous. It was probably better than therapy for him because it was so hands-on. And I think it only lasted about three months, maybe four, but it really helped him. And he came back very, uh, just great. Was he, was he lazy or ambitious or both? How did, how did, has one sort of, and I'm probably changed at different ages of his life, but well, I don't want to say lazy. Well, he says he's lazy too, so. Well, but... yeah, he, he was, he liked to sleep. He never got enough sleep. He was always complaining about not getting enough sleep. And it was because he was, he's, artists just don't. They, their minds are going, if, if their hands aren't going, drawing, playing music, whatever, then their minds are going 90 miles an hour. And uh, so he complained about not getting enough sleep. But he wasn't lazy. I mean, he always did something during the day that was, you know, artistic or not every day, but um, was he I don't ambitious? Know. At what age? <laughs> I don't. Um, ambitious with his music and his writing. See, he was a writer too, so there was a lot of quiet time that you didn't know what he was doing, but I just assumed that's what it was. And um, so he wrote all the time, and he drew a lot and painted. And then I knew when he was playing music because it, it was loud. And so yeah, I would say ambitious, more yeah. than, more than lazy. And did that ambition was a. Was there a point when he kind of really went for it with music? Like maybe, yes. can you talk about that and what age that might have been? Well, I know a lot of other, my old music and what was on MTV, he watched that a lot just to see what was new. He really liked watching the video uh, clips, you know, the different ones that different artists would do, getting ideas like, I mean, I could see him thinking about someday I'll be there. I'll be on MTV. You know, and I, I didn't take it seriously, but I could see him really starting to pay attention to all of that very closely. What age? Oh, probably four, whenever MTV came out, I don't know what year that was. Early 80s. Early 80s. So you'd be 15. Oh, definitely right in there with that. Just He just thought it was just awesome. We all did. I, I thought it was great. Did, go, go ahead. So, you know, I just watched him. I could just see his, him thinking. And it was like, so I wasn't really all that shocked. I mean, I was shocked, but it didn't surprise me that he ended up on M MTV. I could see his brain just ticking away of, and it inspired him to play more. And, you know, after watching a couple hours of it, he would go upstairs and just pound out anything. Did he ever say to you that he wanted to be a rock star or anything like no. that? No. 
He never said he wanted to be on MTV either. I could just see that he was going to head in that direction. Now, at what point did it seem to you that he was not... Can you describe men in Aberdeen in general? No. <laughs> well, Kurt seems very, like, different. Like, yeah, he was... So if we, at what age was it clear that he was not going to be a logger and be... Okay, I was thinking the other day about how I guess he thought at one point he might be gay, which is fine. I mean, it runs in our family. But I kind of felt that he was kind of questioning himself. He would ask me questions about girls and trying to figure out, you know, how to get one, I think. That's what I thought. And I think he was really kind of like wondering because he was artistic. He, and so I started thinking about this the other day and he was really, he and I were best friends. I mean, when he died, I lost one of my best friends. We had so much fun talking about the world and politics and life and music and just everything. We talked all the time. And he was very aware, especially when I was with three not suited men, how that made him feel. He didn't like the way his dad talked to me. He didn't like the way <clears throat> my boyfriend after Don treated me. And with my third husband, I mean, my second husband, I didn't marry the, middle, the guy in the middle. Um, they just, they weren't on the same wavelength at all. Uh, he was a longshoreman, he was around, roo, 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 you know, what you call rednecks. <laughs> um, and I'm not saying that <clears throat> he was very educated and a reader, and but he was around all that, so he blunt, outspoke, you know, like, hey, Kurt, you know, do this, do that. I mean, it wasn't any gentle way with him. And um, I forget the question. It was about <coughs> the men in Aberdeen and the type of masculinity, if you will, type of what, what made a man in Aberdeen and at what point then you realized that Kurt was not going to be one yeah. of those. Well, so I was thinking about this the other day, like I said, and he and I were so close and he was uh, very respectful. He was very courteous, good, really good manners. I made sure of that because Don had none. He, did, he was very in, uncomfortable in public and in social settings because he didn't know manners. He was never taught any manners. And he and I being so close and him having a sister that, sure, they, they picked on each other and they fought and everything, but boy, if anybody messed with Kim, he was right at their front door ready to punch him out. And with me, he was protective and and we were just really close. And I think that is what makes the difference in <clears throat> these rough house boys, you know, jocks and and they're more bonded to their dads, I think, than they are to their mothers. I prefer men that love their mothers. I, they're just gentler. They, they understand women a little bit better. And, um, and then just being an artist, he, everywhere in school, except for English and art, he felt like, the jocks were, you know, I don't know. He never came home and said he was being bullied or that he was being picked on. He never said that. I just assumed that he, because he wasn't into sports, that, and I, I went to school with them, and I remember what they were like. They were very jockey, just ruh, ruh, ruh. when they were together, they were like a, a team, even if they weren't on a team. And so I think Kurt probably felt a little left out that way. And as he got older, he got a little bit more shy about, you know, just maybe less confident. When he was young, he didn't care what people thought. And then as he got older, he became aware that he wasn't like the regular guys. But it didn't mean that he didn't have guy friends. He had a lot of guy friends. What? But they were kind of very much similar to him. 
was, um, I don't want to build too much out of this and we could diffuse it if you want, but was the divorce the first time you think where he started to feel different? Yeah, I saw an anger immediately, like within a month of Don actually being gone for good. And he wasn't minding me. He was mad at me for divorcing him. Even though they didn't have a relationship, hardly at all, uh, he was mad. And it cha because it changed his dynamic in school, you know, like his friends would talk about, you know, mom and dad, and it was mom. And so that lasted until Don and he built a little bit better relationship. And then I talked about it too. There was I used to watch the Phil Donahue show, which really helped me a lot. And one of the psychologists on there said, you know, the best thing to do for children in a divorce is let them know that it had nothing to do with them and let them know that if it is final and it's divorce and, and you're never going back with them, let them know that. So early on, that happened like within the first probably six months of us being divorced, where he was seeing a lot more of his dad every weekend. And um, so I just sat them down one day and I asked them if they thought that just because we were being amicable with each other, if they thought that maybe that was us maybe getting back together, were they holding out hope for that? And, um, and I told them that that wasn't going to happen and I think you need to know that so you don't hold on to that hope and just accept it for what it is and how we have to move forward, you know, all together doing this the best way we can. And that they had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with me divorcing his dad. Um. You, when it came to divorcing Don, I mean, uh, I know we talked a lot about Don being gone a lot, but it, there was also a part of it that you were getting, you were still young. Yes, I right? was, mm -hmm, I was like 27, 28. That's, that's young. And the dream of being Don Reed was the, the ideal of Donna Reed was not as good as the reality of Donna Reed? Well, I just didn't get that family. No matter how much I did that she did, I just, I never got any of it. I didn't get praise. I didn't get thank you. I didn't get, you're pretty. You're, you look nice tonight. I love you. Nothing. First time I ever got flowers from Don was when he was trying to get back with me and, and said, I love you on this car. It, it was so foreign to me to see, I love you that it didn't mean anything to me. It was way too late 